Good morning. Uh, always happy to be back in September for breakfast. Uh, what an interesting summer I imagine um, you've all had. Uh, difficult at times for some of you, but uh, I hope that every, everybody was able to find some things to, to, to do some things that you love, whether or not it be at the cottage or time in the patio. Um, I really do hope you got that opportunity. Uh, this is normally the time of year that I tell everybody how glad I am to see you after the summer, uh, but we've all learned that this is a different world and I can't see you, but I know you're there and a um, lot of familiar names have uh, joined us this morning, but also a lot of new names, which is wonderful. One of the best outcomes of hosting these events on Zoom is seeing how accessible they have become to the nation. Uh, we have guests today from BC, Alberta, right across to Nova Scotia. Uh, to that, please do feel to reach out to me by email, by phone, however you like, uh, for whatever reason, just to say hello, introduce yourself, catch up. Um, we all know that uh, the support we receive from these events is of such importance. Uh, to that, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank Paul Bullock from Everbridge, Jill Ritchie and others from Healthcare Excellence Canada, Jim Shea from Cerner, Michelle Holden from Hiroc, Steve Lowe from LBCG Consulting, uh, Melisent Laver Sally from Medtronic. Um, I, I, they are really important to us and really help to make these events uh, a success for you. Um, I know I'll know that you're familiar with Zoom now, uh, but as a quick reminder, if you're asking questions of our speaker, please do post your questions in the Q&A section. Now, enough from me. Uh, today, we'll, we will be joined by Dr. Quam McKenzie. I've had the opportunity to first meet Quam back in uh, 2015 at another Longwoods event focusing on Ontario Health Links. And since that time, we've had a few meetings and I've enjoyed reading some of his commentaries in Longwood's journals, as well as the national press. I am thrilled that he'll be joining us this morning and I promise you the next 45 minutes will be well worth your time. So Quam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. And thank you uh, Longwood's uh, for asking me to present and uh, to welcome you all back from uh, your summer. And, and thank you all for being here. Now, I'm going to share screens, which is always a, an interesting moment, trying to make sure it happens, because uh, we're going to have a few slides as I go through this. So we're back from summer uh, and we're still in COVID. And I don't have to tell this group um, that COVID has been uh, a very difficult and harrowing time for the health sector. Um, I know most people here, everybody would have been stretched. I know that you know that burnout is at an all time high. And uh, some would say that it's not over yet. We're still in wave four. But we also have to be thinking about um, the recovery and uh, at the same time. And so there's more work to happen. Uh, but I know it might not feel like it. But in many ways, at an international level, a COVID has been a triumph. Um, from an international health perspective, going from no vaccine to a whole bunch of vaccines in 10 months is considered spectacular. And actually having the agreement, though the implementation still needs to happen, of COVAX to vaccinate the world is unprecedented. There have been a whole bunch of positive things. And it may not feel like it, but Canada and Ontario's response and actually the response of most provinces has been significantly better than many other high income countries. 1.5 million cases, 27,000 deaths, but that death rate is four times less than the UK, and the death rate is two times less than uh, the USA. So something has been happening here uh, that has meant that that hard work that has gone into uh, COVID uh, has paid dividends. And there's a question for me, and this is partly what this discussion is about, is are there things that have gone well that we should be bottling, that we should be keeping for the future? Now, it's actually quite difficult 
when you're looking internationally to find huge differences in government policy. There have been delays and a delay of a week or two is about five to 10,000 deaths. Um, so it's, it's difficult to find these huge differences in government policy, uh, but there are other things that may explain the way and what's happened in Canada. One thing is Canadians, and another thing has been the innovation and the work uh, of the uh, health and public health. And that is likely to be where the difference is and why the death rate is so low. And when we say sort of what we're talking, you know, you say, what are you talking about when you're talking about sort of the Canadian population? Well, I've actually been looking at different populations and how they have responded to uh, COVID-19 and public health advice. And the Canadian population has been actually very compliant compared to other populations. And on top of that, uh, there have been um, industry um, innovations. I mean, nobody actually had to tell log laws that they should be uh, opening uh, from seven to eight for high risk groups. Nobody actually told them, they just did that. Uh, and when you look around the world, those sorts of things are compliance of individuals, individuals helping individuals, industry uh, producing uh, innovations has actually been quite important, as have the changes and the speed of change that there's been in the health service, uh, digitalization, uh, and, uh, health services and uh, deciding and hospitals deciding they're going to go in and help long term care. Uh, changes in the way we have done care to decrease risk and hospitals and the health service pushing government hard for uh, lockdowns and other uh, health measures that have helped protect people. All of those things have been important. So I think though there have been tremendous negatives, though people are incredibly tired, the statistics seem to show that something has happened in Canada during this pandemic, which hasn't necessarily happened other places, um, and which has meant that we have had an okay and actually a quite a good response compared to other places. And I am going to be talking today about maybe some of those things, but taking a particular look at things we've done around uh, inequities uh, and whether some of the things that have happened during the pandemic around inequities or trying to decrease inequities uh, are actually going to be things that we need to be thinking about holding on to uh, when we start thinking about recovery. So I'm going to do three things. I'm going to talk a little bit about inequities and what we know about COVID inequities. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, things that may have decreased the impact of inequity on COVID-19. Uh, and then I'm going to do a sort of try and bring it together in a bit of a, a case study about uh, something, uh, the black uh, population in Toronto. So things that we know. We know that the risk of illness and the chance of recovery uh, is mainly due to social factors and access to quality healthcare. This is the Canadian Medical Association's What Makes Us Sick, an attempt to quantify, um, uh, uh, an attempt to quantify uh, what makes us sick, our risk of illness. And you'll see that 85% is what they get to. And therefore, it is not surprising that when we look at COVID-19, uh, just like every other illness, uh, it interacts with social factors and access to healthcare with some biological uh, frailty on top of it to produce differences in risk for different groups. So older people, the biggest risk group, populations with pre-existing health conditions, ethnic minorities, migrants, refugees, homeless populations, people in institutional settings, and people in specific work environments. We all know this, uh, but we don't have necessarily great data. Uh, and I'm gonna present some data from Ontario, some great data from Toronto, just to give us 
some uh, a fine grain view of um, who and what uh, and who's who's been most hardest hit. So starting off uh, looking at uh, race-based data and uh, looking at uh, Ontario, and this is uh, data that's come from uh, the people who've tested positive in Ontario uh, between June 2020 uh, and um, uh, I think it goes through to April 2021. And as you can see, you've got four graphs here. Uh, the graphs are of case rates, hospitalizations, ICU admissions and fatality. And uh, each one of the bars represents a particular racial or ethnic group. Uh, the white group are at the bottom, uh, East Asian, Black, Southeast Asian, Middle Eastern, South Asian and Latino. And you can see whether, it, whether it's cases, hospitalization, ICU admission or fatality, um, the, uh, the Latino, South Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian, Middle Eastern and Black populations are between three and six times more likely uh, to be impacted than the white and the East Asian population. Graphically seen by this, uh, in this uh, uh, data from Toronto, up to March uh, 20, end of March 2021, uh, and easier to see uh, the disparities uh, this way around. Uh, this is the age standardized hospitalizations for COVID-19, and uh, the big um, square, uh, sorry, the big uh, column is um, the population size, and the uh, thinner one is uh, the uh, COVID hospitalizations. So if you look at the white population, 48% of the Toronto population, 24% of uh, COVID hospitalizations. If you look at the black population, 9% of uh, Toronto's population, 17% of COVID hospitalizations. Uh, uh, another way of looking at this is if you look at the 52% of the population who are not white, you find that they are 78% of the uh, people who are hospitalized. Other disparities, again, um, as we would predict, the huge disparities in age. So we know that 75 to 80% of people who died were, um, were uh, 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 in long-term care. And the vast majority of people who died uh, were over the age of 65. Uh, and this is just uh, um, showing um, COVID rates in Toronto uh, by household income. And uh, so if you had a household income of less than $30,000 a year, your COVID, uh, the COVID rates for those households is three times the rate of uh, people who are making 150,000 or more for household uh, income. Uh, and so it's interesting that when you look at income, the income differentials for COVID rates are not as large as the uh, differentials by race. And uh, these uh, impacts um, have, uh, uh, and the different, the inequities uh, have uh, in, 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 um, stayed the same uh, for vaccination as well. Uh, we, in Ontario, didn't collect individual level data for vaccination. So it's difficult to give fine grained, um, but it is possible to show that there's a 10 to 20% difference in vaccination rates in high risk populations, which is not accounted for by income. And that our vaccination rates do not match our infection rates. Now, anytime you see something like this, it looks a bit scary because there are loads of lines on a page, but it's the same graph over and over again for different people. What we're looking for different populations, what we're looking is, uh, and this is up to June, July, 
the uh, proportion of uh, people who have been vaccinated uh, and that's on the uh, y-axis and then on the x-axis along the bottom we've got the concentration of uh, that particular population in a particular area. There's no individual level data, so that's how we're looking at this. So what you're seeing here, say taking that first graph, is that as more, you find more South Asian people in an area, the vaccination rate drops. And it's the same for the black population, uh, but a steeper drop, uh, and the same for the Southeast Asian population and the Latino population. It is the opposite for the Chinese population with increased rates of uh, vaccination when you get more uh, people of Chinese origin in an area. Interestingly, if you look at the last graph, that is poverty. And it shows that the more poverty there is in an area doesn't change vaccination rates. Whether you've got a low poverty area or a high poverty area, you have the same vaccination rate. And one last graph, uh, and this is a pretty one, but a disturbing one. And this is just for the black population. And what it's showing is the rate of vaccination and the rate of COVID uh, dependent on how big the black population is in an area over seven different times from March 2021 through May 2021. So looking through um, the, as the vaccine was being rolled out. And two things you can see that are happening here. One is, and this is the bottom graph, as the, uh, you find more black people in an area, um, the rates of COVID are higher. And this has continued throughout all of those seven time scales. However, when you see uh, the more black people you have in an area, the lower the rate of uh, vaccinations. So even though vaccination rates are going up between March and May, so between the dark blue and the light blue line, March and May, more, many more people have been vaccinated. Uh, proportionately fewer people have been vaccinated in areas that are predominantly black compared to areas uh, where there are fewer black people, even though those areas are the areas at highest risk of COVID. So by now, you may have come to the long, Longwood's breakfast and started saying, I'm depressed, why am I here? Um, you know, we start, he started off saying that we'd actually done a good job, uh, but then he has spent time explaining these significant and, and terrible disparities uh, between income groups, areas uh, and uh, ethnic groups, both in um, uh, COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, deaths, ICU, and also in vaccination and vaccination is lagging behind. Uh, and yes, this is true. We have significant and persistent disparities. Uh, but the truth is, despite these disparities, there's actually been effective action taken during the pandemic, which we could learn from. And actually, compared to many countries in the world, our disparities are relatively low. So I'm not saying we don't have disparities. I'm not saying they're not a problem. But I'm saying that we have... Uh, things that we have been doing that have decreased the disparities. And we need to think about whether they're things that we want to hold on to now we're thinking about recovery and how and when we're thinking of developing effective, um, um, most effective and most efficient uh, health service for the future.
I'm going to go through a few of these and some of them will be provocative and some of them are there for discussion. Uh, and I'm hoping to get through them in uh, 10 minutes so that we can have a full discussion uh, and I can take questions. So possible lessons for discussion. Federal income support. Now, I, I think most of you, nobody would have thought that would have been first on my list, but the truth is that uh, there is quite a lot of evidence uh, that um, the uh, federal income, and especially the CERB early on, uh, is credited for decreasing COVID impacts, including rates of anxiety and depression. And in fact, the Statistics Canada data, which seems to show that the rates of anxiety and depression in uh, low income and people who'd lost their jobs post serb is, uh, was actually lower than people who'd lost their job, who didn't have a job uh, pre serb as, as you might expect. Uh, but the lesson and the question that we have to think about is the place of federal economic policy in health and how we want to think about that going forward and how we want to lever that because the CERB impact is, is significant. And when we're looking at rates of COVID or rates of vaccination uh, and we're seeing not significant differences or no or differences which aren't as big as uh, other social factors, we need to question about whether that is a smoothing effect that's happened because of uh, federal income support policy and whether that's a big thing we need to be thinking about for the future. All of you have been involved in digital health expansion and probably all of you have heard the criticisms of digital health expansion and the fact that it increases inequities, those with good uh, data connections, those who are computer literate um, are more likely to get access to treatment. And those who can be treated online, younger people, people who are tech savvy, uh, people who are happy to speak into a camera, much as I'm doing at the moment, are the people who are much better in digital health. And so people will see it as a problem, but actually that rapid change to digital health uh, is, in my mind, one of uh, the most exciting equity issues uh, that we need to think about in future. Actually, if we were able to deal with the digital divide, if we were able to do cultural and linguistic adaptation of um, uh, the tools that we're using for digital health, this could increase access to care, our range of care, our ability to move, uh, to, to, produce, to give uh, people who've never had access to appropriate, uh, culturally appropriate care, appropriate culturally appropriate care, uh, and could uh, actually um, decrease our inequities. It's a major tool. And the fact that we've gone this way uh, now means that we could, in theory, use this to produce excellent care. You knew I was going to talk about sociodemographic data collection. Individual level data and during COVID identified disparities, supported advocacy and changed, uh, sorry, advocacy for change and monitored progress. And so it was really, really useful. We understood where the problems were and uh, what needed to be done. And we could see whether we'd made a difference. So very, very important to have sociodemographic data collection. Uh, but the lesson is it's not the collection of data that's important. It's the collection, analysis and use. And if you can do that, it's a true game changer. And what you're seeing is you're seeing the Toronto um, uh, COVID uh, status of cases, which includes uh, um, interactive uh, work that you can do on ethnoracial group income, 
uh, and infection rates. And the fact that uh, people, especially the press, were able to get hold of this data uh, and they were able to uh, not, uh, analyze these data and produce reports about these data was quite important for keeping the ideas of equity and what we're going to do about equity uh, in the public view. So that data analysis, uh, public collection analysis, publication, um, and data transparency really is something that significantly, in my mind, changed uh, the environment for healthcare and the environment for equity in healthcare. And going forward, the question is, whether we can hardwire it. Do we need to think about putting selected uh, socio-demographic um, uh, sort of uh, uh, data on uh, people's uh, or collecting them at the time uh, people change their OHIP card so that we have that data uh, available to use and available to uh, monitor the progress of our system. Is this something that we should be thinking about for the future? Community health centres and their role in decreasing inequity in inequities uh, during the pandemic is something that um, those close to the community health centres have seen, but those not uh, would have missed. Uh, they were able to reach groups that no one else could, and that's because they were trusted and because they actually had community knowledge. The question for us going forward is whether we need to build on that. Um, you know, in theory, they're the cornerstone of effective, equitable healthcare in Ontario because they can do things that others can't. The question is whether we are going to fund and support them in doing that and integrate their work into. Uh, the rest of the healthcare uh, system in a way that makes sense. Uh, we can't uh, just ask them to do things without giving them the backup and giving them resources. But if we ask them to do things, they are doing what they're supposed to, which is reaching groups no one else could and increasing equity. They have been part of cross-sector partner partnerships community CHCs and hospital partnerships. Um, you will remember right at the start of the vaccine rollout, uh, we're going out and doing things differently and getting to uh, groups that uh, nobody else could get to. I remember my uh, son uh, coming back from getting his vaccination saying, you know, this is amazing. It was a celebration. There was a DJ. Um, I was given, uh, you know, my va vaccination and I was given a, a roti and a drink and it was fabulous and I am going back. <laughs> and this sort of working with community and uh, pushing public health in a community fashion really changed the rate of vaccination. And so though the rate of vaccination is still 10%, maybe 20% behind, if that had not been done, we would be a long way behind and a long way behind in the uh, groups who are at highest risk. But one of the things we've learned from that and we need to think about as a system is how you include people. One of the things you're seeing at the moment and a lot of the pushback and a lot of the anti-vax stuff is about things being done to people and things being done to community rather than including community and giving them roles in how you roll out healthcare. And if you don't do that, increasingly you get pushback. And so we've got a question now that there are these partnerships that have been set up, these vertical partnerships, how we maintain them how we support them financially, and how we use them as a way of properly including communities and inv individuals as part of our um, health response. Uh, because if we can do that, then uh, we are in a much better place. People didn't like the hotspot strategy. Uh, 
some people, sorry, let's get it right. Some people didn't like it. Some people didn't like the fact that we were targeting specific resources to the hardest hit areas. Uh, that uh, we actually did it during the um, wave uh, three, and it did actually uh, decrease rates of COVID. And uh, doing it for a few weeks uh, decreased the overall, the uh, improved the overall vaccination rollout as well. And then it was taken away. Uh, and uh, we are in a situation where we are still uh, 10 to 20% behind in hotspot air in some, in some populations within the hotspot areas, uh, partly because of in, in, uh, not enough resource. Uh, and the question is not about hotspot strategy itself, but more about um, whether the hotspot strategy starts us thinking again about uh, how we get health funding models that match needs. So how we um, have the most effective and efficient healthcare funding models uh, so that we can actually get our resources where they're best needed and whether that hotspot hot, hot strategy is something we need to think through going forwards. I'm gonna do a very quick case study and then go to questions. Uh, because it's easy to think of any one of these things in isolation, but the actual, um, the actual magic comes when they come together. I'm going to tell you something about the Black Health Equity Working Group. March 2020, there were high rates of COVID-19 in the UK and the US Black populations, and we had the rise of Black Lives Matter. And that led to the birth of the Black Health Equity Working Group, which was community, clinicians, academics, and policymakers coming together, first of all, to ask the question of whether there are high rates of COVID in the Black population, and then to start thinking about what needed to be done about it. And the idea was to decrease inequities through the alignment of community, academics, and service providers in government. Um, and the idea was a data-driven quantification for monitoring and transparency and evidence-informed community-driven public health and policy solutions. And there was an emergent strategy um, where there was a use of, uh, there was a trying to promote the analysis of existing data, census data at an area level and uh, showing disparities between groups or areas uh, and that being released in the media. But the aim of that was to stimulate action, but also stimulate individual level sociodemographic data collection. Uh, then analysis and publication, community consultation, producing initiatives to improve equity, and then trying to make sure that this was aligned with other things that were happening. Uh, and these initial area-based analyses, say for instance for Toronto, showed that uh, COVID was 10 times higher in some areas than others, and uh, that the best predictors of uh, COVID was uh, the percentage of racialized population uh, uh, rather than low income or overcrowding. And so there's real clear that that Northwest Toronto was a COVID hotspot, uh, uh, but we needed more data. Uh, also, those analyses led to sort of uh, May, um, Toronto, London, Peel and Middlesex started collecting race-based data and uh, income data. June, uh, province of Ontario changed the law to start collecting social demographic data for people who tested positive. Uh, from August, once the first analyses were in place and the hotspots were identified, uh, Toronto consulted its communities to start asking what needed to be done. And by September, Toronto had brought an equity action plan to City Council, though it had started work on equity actions uh, from August. And those equity actions included a community-based multilingual public health campaign, community testing and pop-up testing sites, and masks and sanitizers, a free, free voluntary isolation site, eviction prevention, food security, emergency childcare, digital access, and culturally appropriate multilingual counseling. And this graph, which is the last graph you have to see, is really uh, just showing what the 
impact is. What you're looking at is the rate ratios of COVID-19 for racialized groups versus white groups from in Toronto from June to December 2020. And so uh, if, say, for instance, you look at the second line down, which is the uh, black population, um, in June, um, the, they were, had six times the rate of COVID from the, compared to the white population. By July, it was eight times. By August, it was nine times the rate of the white population. But as these equity-focused um, interventions started coming in, uh, the rates came down significantly. Uh, so by December, it was about twice the rate. Now, those are still inequities, but they are much smaller inequities. And the fact that we have smaller inequities is, is good. It shows that it is possible to decrease inequities by this concerted action. And whether you're looking at the Latin American, the South Asian or the Southeast Asian populations, they all have lower um, relative rate ratios of COVID-19 compared to the white population in December compared to June, June, showing it is possible and effective action was in place. And people are interested in this. People have been studying these effects, both the Ontario, the Toronto and the Canadian effects and discussing these issues. And people who've been doing that, such as the WHO, believe that uh, there are some fundamental and, fi and fu uh, foundational principles. Uh, they're thinking about the idea of primary care and community-led healthcare recovery from COVID-19. But a lot of them are thinking about whether this is a way of producing more efficient health systems uh, by action on inequity. And the real question is, do we? Do we think these are things that are effective? Do we believe that these are things that need to be bottled, so to speak, uh, and uh, taken forward and uh, used in the health service going forward, not just in COVID, uh, to see whether that improves uh, at the effectiveness and efficiency of care? Thank you. I will move to questions and first question is, uh, I'm curious if there's any data in relation to indigenous people in Canada uh, during the pandemic. And that is a really good question. I haven't presented data on the indigenous populations because I haven't got it. Uh, the data that I have seen has shown that there are increased rates of COVID uh, in indigenous populations, both on reserve and off, off reserve. Uh, but the same sort of an, uh, disaggregated analysis to try and find out why or what could be done to improve it is not something that I have had access to. Uh, you'll understand that uh, dig indigenous data uh, has certain agreements attached to it and that often uh, indigenous scholars uh, are uh, trying to uh, make sure that they are able to analyze the data to make sure that those data uh, are properly analyzed. And I'm not an indigenous scholar. So I'm not, uh, I haven't, uh, so I've stayed clear of that, but there are indigenous scholars who have been looking at uh, that, um, uh, that work. But it's, it's a good question. I'm not an indigenous scholar, so I haven't uh, included uh, and I don't discuss those data, um, but there are many indigenous scholars who, who do. Uh, second question is um, from Rebecca. And Rebecca's asking, um, can uh, you comment on the relationship between healthcare and community leaders? And it's interesting, um, there have been surveys of various communities and it has depended on the community and also which leader you're talking about. So if you're looking at community health centers, 
and some primary care who are nested in their communities. There is good relationship and a trusted relationship between community leaders and, um, and healthcare uh, leaders. But if you're talking about uh, sometimes uh, health officials and policymakers who are further away from community, uh, that can be uh, more problematic. So it depends. Uh, there is no reason why a good community uh, hospital cannot have really, really great community relations and that the leaders can't have community relations. But those are things you have to work at and you have to work at over time. And community engagement isn't necessarily um, enough. And I always joke that uh, I don't know how long uh, my wife would have allowed me to stay engaged. Um, at some time you have to move to marriage. And the question is whether, whether you're a CHC or whether you're a hospital, whether you are married to your community, whether you're able to give up power, whether you're able to say that you have a shared destiny uh, and whether you negotiate those in a way that happens during a marriage, but not during engagement. So we've got Sarah Downey. Can I comment on whether I think Ontario health teams are the mechanism by which we can develop and sustain health equity strategies and improvements? Uh, do you think that communities served by advanced OHTs have uh, better adapted strategies to protect local, um, uh, uh, local populations from COVID-19? So really, really, really good question. And uh, I do believe that there is an opportunity in Ontario health teams uh, by if, if properly constituted uh, to um, uh, produce more equitable care. And it does depend on how included and how nested uh, the Ontario health team is in its community. Uh, so uh, I tend to think of Ontario health teams like anything else as a tool. And part of it is what are you trying to, what's the problem you're trying to fix? And therefore, what does the tool need to look like? And then uh, some of it is um, whether you've constituted the tool in a way that it will actually be able to do the job you're trying to do. And so I do believe myself that OHTs are an, an important and uh, possible resource, but it does depend how they're led and how they're constituted. And I think that to a certain extent can also be said of whether um, adapted uh, strategies, uh, whether OHTs have adapted strategies to protect local populations from COVID-19. Not anything, I, I find that really difficult to answer because uh, partly I don't know the answer to it, I think. Um, and I'd have to think about it um, and get back to you because I know that you are, um, uh, uh, you're there as the, um, uh, the head of the OHA and therefore um, I know where I can find you. And so I'll get back to you on that if that's okay and I'll have to think about that, Sarah. Um, another question, how do we take this start and maintain um, after the pandemic. And I, I do think that, um, you know, part of what I was trying to do today is start the conversation. And so starting this conversation and saying, you know, despite the doom and gloom, there have been positives. And some of those positives um, have been masked by the fact that if they weren't there, things would have been much worse. And so I think part of what I'm trying to do here is start this conversation about trying to think of what we're gonna bottle, what we're gonna keep from uh, our, what we've uh, experienced so far and how we're gonna move forward. And so I was hoping that this was the start of a process of seeding these ideas into people's minds and then into the power structures across uh, Canada of health to, to start looking for those gems and adding to those gems because uh, Canada, as I said before, has had um, not a bad pandemic, which means that we've been doing something that other people haven't been doing. And we need to be smart about how we make sure we continue doing those. I'm just trying to find one last question, because uh, there are a number, you can't see them, but I can see a whole bunch coming in.
Okay. Uh, I'm surprised by the data regarding COVID uh, rates, vaccination rates and economic status. Can you say more about why we aren't seeing uh, the usual phenomenon of the impacts of poverty uh, stroke uh, health on uh, health behaviours. And um, I think it's important to take some of these data with a pinch of salt. We are trying to look at these data on an area basis because we haven't got individual level data. And um, once we, if we had individual level data, we would be able to tease out exactly what's going on and we would then be able probably to give uh, more information about what's happening. Frankly, we don't know exactly what's happening there uh, and having better data would help us understand it because, and if we really have been able to flatten um, this, uh, what we normally see, which is a link between uh, poverty, low income and poor health and um, sort of health behaviours and we've been able to change that, we need to understand it because we need to do it uh, for cancer screening, we need to do it uh, for other health behaviours and so this is part of the, the sort of what I'm hoping for which is to use some of these data that are coming out and this knowledge that's coming out to really say, well, just a second, what happened there? And what can we learn from it? And how can we make us uh, better going forward and produce a more efficient health service and a more effective health service? But I can see that Matthew's on, which means I'm out of time. I know that there's some really great questions coming through that I haven't had a chance to answer. Um, I'm really glad that so many people uh, turned up. It's a difficult issue, uh, but the aim was to stimulate conversation um, and to really say, well, partly thank you, because I know everybody's been working hard, but also, you know, can we really be a learning, um, uh, a learning system? And even when things look like they've gone not so well, what can we learn from them to be better going forwards? So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Quam. Um, and just to follow up on your questions, um, I do always uh, forward any questions uh, that Quam did not get an opportunity to, to respond to. He will get a copy of those questions and he may get an opportunity to follow up with them on Twitter or some other form. So please do make sure you follow him on Twitter. He's uh, fairly active. Um, other than that, uh, we're done for the day. Our next event will be coming up in October. Uh, it'll be online very shortly, and you'll see the invitations coming out shortly. It'll be uh, Jeff Martha, the chairman and CEO for Medtronic, with Neil Fraser, the president of Medtronic Canada. Other than that, again, thank you very much to, to Quam McKenzie, and have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye.